Our guest in this segment is Chris Anders. We've had Chris on the program numerous times as a guest and as a co-host on occasion with our Friday uh, panel as well. He is now running for the House of Delegates. Chris, good morning to you. Uh, good morning, Rob. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful roads out there today. That's all I have to say. A lot of fun getting to the studio. Where did you come in from? I came in from, uh, I live over in Weinbrenner Crossing, so mm -hmm. it wasn't far but it, it was a great adventure. So <laughs> the big surprise for me is Eagle School Road, right out here in, in front of the the studio, which is normally just on a cold day is terrible. It's treacherous with a lot of ice and what have you. I it was clear. Yeah, I was surprised. Yeah. Well, our roads aren't. I will tell you that Weinbrenner and uh, Golf Course Road frozen solid. So everybody be careful out there. Files cross is the same way. More yeah. snow coming. Yep. Uh, by the way, uh, Thursday night into Friday. Chris, you are running for the uh, House of Delegates. What? Uh, this is the John Hardy seat to John currently holds, correct? That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Uh, why have you decided to make this choice? Well, um, as you know, I've worked uh, for the better part of uh, two decades you know, in politics, whether it's been with nonprofit groups such as Campaign for Liberty or Young Americans for Liberty, the National Association for Gun Rights, Students for Your life action or you know packs but uh you know i really realized i had to get involved when i was watching the legislature which is what i do a lot of times i call it watching criminal lines uh, <laughs> you're gonna make bill angry if you talk like that. <laughs> <laughs> but i uh you know I, I, I was watching the legislature in west virginia and we're a very conservative state and the and the voters are very conservative and i was watching as uh when i was working with students for life and we were uh working to pass uh life at conception mm -hmm. right and the bill goes over to the state senate which we know is run by uh senator craig blair and shortly the uh the bill gets gutted and it gets gutted in the senate not by the democrats but what I lovingly refer to as undocumented Democrats that ran as Republicans. And the bill was completely gutted in the Senate, and thankfully the House rejected it and gave us a chance to go back and fight for life of conception, which we did get. Um, however, I, I do disagree greatly with the Hardy Amendment. I believe that life does begin at conception, no matter how the child was conceived. You have to be consistent about things. If life begins at conception, it begins at conception. And any government that considers itself moral or just must protect that most innocent life. So I became you know, convinced that, okay, I've got to run. I've got to get down to Charleston. Um, I've been in politics uh, for, for a very long time. Um, I've done everything from right legislation to, I've led fights probably hundreds of times now either to stop bad legislation whether it's red flag gun confiscation gun bans in Virginia um, taxes uh, and I've also led fights to pass good legislation life at conception constitutional carry so I've been very very busy and I know the legislative process I understand parliamentary procedure I know how the cake is baked so in other words, on the first day, I wouldn't be a rookie. I understand legislative process, I understand bill drafting, I understand how the entire process works, or in the case of government, doesn't work a lot of times. What else besides the abortion issue has created this desire to run for office? Well, besides the abortion issue, I look at the amount of crony capitalism, where we're funding hundreds of millions of dollars uh, of taxpayer money uh, to out-of-state uh, corporations such as uh, Forum Energy and Bill Gates, you know, to bring uh, their businesses into West Virginia. I look at the amount of taxes that West Virginians pay. Um, you know, it, essentially what we have here is government just keeps growing. And I'm a constitutional conservative. I'm as pro-life as you can get. I'm as pro-gun as you can get. I believe that every gun, anti-gun law is unconstitutional completely. You're not going to find anybody more pro-gun and more pro-life than me. Um, it's I a safe state to be that in. It's, well, obviously, but I've, no matter, I've lived in uh, Maryland. I grew up in Sharpsburg on a small uh, goat farm. I don't tell many people that, but I guess I just Sounds told like a whole bunch of people that. Started the short uh, story. I grew right up there. on a goat farm, and um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time with my grandparents, um, and I still have a hunting ground over in Maryland. Uh, but I moved to West Virginia shortly thereafter because, you know, I, I saw the direction Maryland was going and I didn't agree with it. Uh, they're all their anti-gun laws or anti-freedom laws. I became uh, really involved about the time Ron Paul ran for president. I remember uh, the that. first yeah. time in 08. Did you ever uh, get his signs down from I-81, by the way? I was on there for like 12 years <laughs> I, on that they, they might. I might know who might have put those up. I don't know. <laughs> we'll go back and get a couple of those. They're still out, I think. 
they they would be good mementos at this point. And I was I was blessed to be on the 2012 or be part of the 2012 Ron Paul uh, team and the 2016 Rand Paul. Um, and since then, like I said, I've been very involved with politics. The past six years, I work full time in politics. Um, so I'm an instructor for the Foundation for Applied Conservative Leadership. So I've done a lot of things. But I, I really look at West Virginia as we could be a real lighthouse for liberty. We could we could be a shining light for freedom. Uh, there's a few things that need to change. Uh, we need to, A, repeal the Hardy Amendment. We need to stop the crony capitalism. Um, we need to look at civil liberties in a, in a different way, uh, whether that's repealing civil asset forfeiture, which I absolutely agree with. But I'm a constitutional conservative, most of all. You know, whenever I look at any issue, I look at it three ways. One, is it constitutional as the Founding Fathers intended? Okay. Two, is it moral? as a part of the duty of government. You know, our, our country was founded on the Lockean principles of protecting individual life, individual liberty, and private property rights. And third, does it grow or shrink government? And the more government grows, every time government grows, it's more spending. And more spending means more taxes. And they either tax it directly from the people or they tax it through inflation which a lot of West Virginians today, you know, they don't understand. They used to go to the grocery store with 50 bucks and you get a lot of grocery for 50 bucks. Now you walk out with three bags and I happen to drink a lot of Diet Mountain Dew and a 12 pack of Diet Mountain Dew and I spent a hundred bucks. And they don't realize that's the most insidious tax of them all and that's the inflation tax. And that has to do with the fact that government, when you can't tax you anymore and we can't borrow anymore from China, we end up printing more money and that creates the inflation. So every time somebody talks about increasing government to help the people, what you're doing is actually increasing government to hurt the people because you're increasing spending, which is taxes. Do you define uh, government growth as additional people hired, additional spending? Uh, if we define it as additional spending, then every time a person who's employed by the government and in West Virginia, that includes teachers, gets a raise, you're growing government. Well, I look at gov government in of itself uh, is is the uh, is the opposite of individual liberty. As government grows, your liberty and your property but reduces. But def define government growth for me in terms of how you're referencing it. I would say it's government spending. And every time the government spends more money. Now, understand with the inflationary policies of the Biden administration, which is what we're all suffering under, I mean, um, you know, everybody's having a tough time, whether it's going to the grocery store. I saw something where Big Mac meals were going for like 18 bucks somewhere recently. $18 for a Big Mac? Yeah, I think, I think it started, of course, where everything else like that starts in California. I've been eating one of those in 30-something years. So Yeah, I try to avoid those too. Yeah. But, um, but, you know, you understand that just like when Governor Justice proposed his budget, it was, okay, we're going to, you know, I agree we should cut tax taxation on social security. Absolutely. I think we should cut the income tax a hundred percent. I don't think anybody should be taxed on the money that they make immediately or phased in uh, immediately. How do you make up the revenue? Uh, you cut government. It really is that simple. Is cutting government is cutting government firing people. Is it, is it, uh, is it cutting salaries? You gotta, you're giving me, well, you're right. giving me round definitions of what government is and I got to get a, a specific one. So I know what you're referencing. Well, the first one I would do is I would uh, cut out the, uh, the government department of economic development because they spend hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars. Right. And the only reason we found out about Form Energy is they went over their budget. So then they had to have a vote in the legislature to give Bill Gates his $290 million for this boondoggle. Uh, but they spent hundreds of millions of dollars. So you start cutting that back. So that's not one of the roles of government, okay? Remember, our country was founded on the Lockean principles of life, liberty, and property, okay? Not central planning. And our government spends way too much time trying to centrally control our lives and control our economy. And that's not how we were great, and that's not how we'll be great again. But I think the personal income tax results in about $2 billion in collection in this state, if mm -hmm. I understand the numbers correctly. So you've got to eliminate $2 billion in government spending. Correct. That's just not the Department it, of Economic Development. No, no, you can find other ways. I mean, you can look around at governments always. If you look for the least efficient way to do anything, 
have government do it. So there's always ways to go back. Now, you know, there's a lot of stuff we can talk about, like, you know, a lot of people's worried about the educational system, right? And the educational system does need a lot of help in West Virginia. If it went, I often say if it wouldn't be for Mississippi, we'd be in big trouble, right? No, they, 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 just, they just beat us. <laughs> okay. Well, I was wrong on that yeah. one. But the thing is, you know, I believe in total and complete school choice. And if you, if you do total universal school choice where the money follows the student, right? Competition breeds excellence and it also reduces cost. So there's a lot of ways to look at things and I haven't had a chance to delve into the 2024 budget exactly how Justice put it together. I've been busy in places like Pennsylvania stopping red flag gun confiscation because that's what I do full time for a living, you know, is uh, defend the Constitution in, in up to six, well, currently six states, um, trying to pass the complete and total uh, repeal of the income tax in Ohio. OK, it can be done. It absolutely can be done. So but I would love to take a look at the budget. I'd love to have that time. But when you work full time in politics, you're about 20 hours a day. So sleep is optional. Billy. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned you work uh, 20 hours a day as a lobbyist and you have six or seven states that you are the point person. How can you do this, Chris, and still hold an elective office of being in Charleston for 60 days and then all the other additional times you need to be involved? Well, because once I'm elected, I no longer can be employed uh, by Young Americans for Liberty. Is that so you'd give that job up? I absolutely okay. would. You, when you came in, you made a blanket statement. I've forgotten exactly what your verbiage was, but it implied that anyone that does not agree with you and you had a term for them. This kind of carries us back to a discussion we have quite often. Rhino, what is your definition of a Republican in name only? Well, the, Rhino has been used a lot. I tend to call it um, undocumented Democrats. It's a term that I tend to use. Um, anyone who, who violates, let's say, uh, the founding principles of our country, the Constitution as originally written, and votes to constantly expand government, because that's not the Republican Party roots. Uh, for example, there's two Isn't bills. that more libertarian than it is Republican? No. No, it's what the Republican Party used to be until uh, George, uh, not George Bush, but... Um, uh, George Bush was part of the problem, but Bill Clinton convinced the Republicans they could get what they wanted out of big government, too. Uh, he, he and Newt uh, Gingrich. Uh, but if you look at, um, like, for example, there are two bills I'm looking at in West Virginia that are absolutely horrible right now. One of which uh, is a bill uh, put in by a uh, quote unquote Republican to bring, bring speed cameras to our state, which are a huge scam and they're unconstitutional to violate your Sixth Amendment right to face your accuser. The second one is, and this is one one that we fought a like bill in West Virginia many years ago, whereas if you're involved in a traffic accident, the police are given the authority to take your blood without a warrant. Okay, and while I'm a Second Amendment abolitionist, I also believe in the Fourth Amendment, which means if they want to take somebody's blood, they better dag on well get a warrant for it, right? Um, and like I said, with the, with the speed cameras, you have a right to face your accuser, and these speed cameras are just one big scam where you know speed camera companies get a portion of the revenue and the, and the government gets a portion um, and so the speed camera companies use that portion to hire more lobbyists to put out more cameras and you also have a right to face your accuser what are they going to do bring the camera in and put it in front of you so um, these are some examples of republicans or quote unquote republicans that have been elected uh, as republicans not doing republican things does that make sense yeah, from your perspective, yes. <laughs> I, I do not agree with that, but I, I can appreciate your point. Another question, Chris, uh, running for office, and I'm going to simplify, the, I'm going to put in two categories, and I realize there's a lot of overlap between the two, but for the simplicity of a, of a question, uh, I consider Republicans are, or, or anybody is a what I would call a Chamber of Commerce Republican who looks at the physical issues first or the social warrior who looks at the cultural issues. Which of these two would you put yourself in? I would put myself in the liberty category. You know, I would look at, you know, personal liberty, economic liberty, okay? Um, I am a, where I differ, you brought up the term libertarians, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm absolutely against the woke ideology. It is a rot on this country. Oh, uh, what ideology? The woke ideology. Oh, I see. Okay, okay, okay yeah. The woke yeah, ideology, yeah, yeah. which is, which is a rot 
uh, on, on the uh, fabric of our nation. Uh, and I'm also uh, pro-life beyond pro-life, basically. And, and that, you know, I, I get in a lot of arguments uh, with the uh, quote-unquote uh, libertarians who are always trying to prove one is more pure than the other one. I've never understood that one. I've always been a registered Republican. Am I in the Rand Paul camp of the Republican yeah. Party? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I would drill down a little bit on the crony capitalism, mm-hmm. which which is, you know, it, it's a... It's a throwaway term. And when we look at the state of West Virginia, one of the most crippling elements in the belly of the state, we don't have it so much here, but the poverty that exists. Mm -hmm. And poverty drives everything that is negative, uh, from unemployment to bad education to just everything. So without jobs, there's no resolution to the poverty Mm -hmm. so without investment into companies whether they come from uh, from a different state or if they they have a a billionaire uh, investor once those companies come to the state they build their factories what the the employees of those factories even if they're from out of out of state spend their money they buy their lunch here in in West Virginia. Mm-hmm. Isn't that you call it crony capitalism? But isn't that the seed money that funds growth? And in order to get the seed money, you've got to attract the companies. And in order to attract the companies, you got to beat out the incentives that are coming from the neighboring states. Well, there's multiple ways you attract companies. One thing, one way is that the way we've been doing it, where we take taxpayer money. And we offer it, you know, basically giving tax cut to companies to come here. That's one way. The other way is to cut business taxes across across the board, because when you're giving taxpayer money to one company, it's government picking winners and losers. It's saying this company, we like this company, we want to bring this company in. You know, the the other other way is a much more uh, conservative way and saying, well, we'll just make it even for everybody. We'll just cut business taxes as much as we can. We will you know, get rid of the horrible business inventory tax. I know we've tried, but we've got to hammer that one through. We've got to get rid of that. We need to make West Virginia more business friendly. Now, what West Virginia has done, which has been uh, beautiful, is they've passed right to work. I've worked a lot with the National Right to Work Committee. Um, uh, good people, hardworking people, and no one should, should be forced to pay union dues to have a job. Um, but, you know, it, it, you know, we've half passed that. We've done a lot of good conservative social issues. We've done a lot, whether it's protecting the unborn, whether it's, you know, pro-gun legislation. We've done a lot of good stuff there. Uh, where we're missing is economic liberty. We need to, you know, make West Virginia open for business by making it very business friendly. There's, we need to cut the regulations. We need to cut the taxes. We need to th- open it up because it's unfair that one company moving in from out of state gets all these benefits, whereas companies that are already here, run by West Virginians, don't get any benefit. We have to make it an even playing field. See, government cannot uh, guarantee equality of outcome, but you can you can create co- equality of opportunity, if that makes sense. I, I also want to, this is a question, not an agenda at, at all. We talk about how conservative the voting base of West Virginia is, but that conservative trend isn't yet 10 years old. Mm-hmm. It, it changed in 2016. So how confident are you? 2016 was also when the Democrats were running Hillary Clinton, who mm-hmm. probably the least winnable candidate in this part of the world as they as they could run so and and then we had the trump era how confident are you that the body politic has really in eight years shifted so far to the right to to support that you are representing their points of view extremely confident i'll tell you what i was part of with campaign for liberty in 2013 and 2014 when the house flipped which the legislative body is the most powerful branch of government, okay? And when the House started flipping and we started doing things like I worked on constitutional care, we started doing all. If you look at the fabric of West Virginia, okay, a lot of West Virginians that were Democrats uh, were what my granddaddy would call like the old Dixiecrats, the Blue Dog Democrats, things like that. They were pro-gun, pro-life, uh, but they, they thought they always voted Democrat. I, my grandfather died a Democrat, I believe, but I don't think he voted Democrat in the past in the last 30 years he was alive. I don't think uh, leading up, even I don't think he voted for JFK. 
I don't know. I wasn't alive. I might be a little old, but I'm not that old. Hey, 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 <laughs> hey, hey. hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm very confident in that because if you talk to people around the state, mostly what they worry about is they worry about, they do worry about the economy. How can I afford to keep a roof over my head and food on my table at the crazy increasing prices of inflation? They worry about, you know, the moral fabric of our, of our country. I'm a Christian. You know, there's a lot of Christians in West Virginia and you hear about it you know whether they're tearing down monuments someplace or they're you know doing crt in schools or whatever the case may be um you know the the left has gone what happened is when you had the uh the the clinton obama face off in the democratic party what you had was essentially what they called the arizona plan which was more of your uh, hillary clinton plan right which was we need to get the the uh you know the uh, rust belt voters back we need to get the uh the you know like the everyday uh, american joes back to the democratic party uh, and then you had the other plan that the clintons had i think it's called the chicago plan was like go as far left on social issues as you possibly can right that's the party that took over the democrats that fraction of going far left on all these social issues Chris, you, you made the point that uh, a Christian and tearing down monuments, you made that, you, you equated the two. Uh, I don't see how they necessarily equate. Also, the evangelical movement has now been defined more of a political movement than a religious movement. Would you speak to that? Okay. Prior to, uh, 19, prior to Jimmy Carter getting elected, uh, the uh, Southern evangelicals voted mostly a third Republican a third Democrat and a third were swing votes. Uh, then when Jerry Falwell created the new right, as he called it, uh, now you have 85% of evangelicals voting Republican. Um, some people look at that as a political move. I'm not, okay, I'm, I'm a born again Christian. Okay, I don't I don't look at and I don't try to force my beliefs on anybody else. That is a part of my moral base when I look at, you know, government and what it should be doing um, and in protecting, you know, the unborn and so on. Um, but they don't really go hand in hand. The reason I mentioned the monument thing is that there is a destruction of the fabric of the country. I mean, they were looking at taking William Penn down in Pennsylvania, the founder of Pennsylvania, because somebody might be offended somehow, some way, because there's a monument to the founder of Pennsylvania. History is history. I'm a big historian. I'm a history dork, okay? Um, I, I grew up in Sharpsburg, which means I wandered on the battlefield all the time as a kid, right? I've done historical reenacting for 30 years, um, and I do it to understand more what they sacrificed to provide us with the liberty and freedom today. We have the 250th anniversary of the American War for Independence coming up in 2025, right? Um, there's a lot, I spent a lot of time reading the letters the soldiers wrote, not the generals, the soldiers, and what they went through to give us our freedom and liberty. Um, the sad thing is we probably had more freedom under King George III then than we do under our current system of government now. I mean, we rebelled against a 2% tax on a breakfast beverage that wasn't coffee. When most people today, your average American citizen, spends 30% of their money on taxes and government. That's not what the Founding Fathers attended, and that's not. Uh, Patrick Henry, I remember uh, I was reading an account of he and James Madison going back and forth at the Virginia Constitutional Convention. And James Madison's like, we gotta have all these rules, we gotta grow government big because America's gotta be great. And Patrick Henry stopped him and said, no sir, when we started, liberty was a primary object. But the, Bill, we, we're out of time, uh, and we got to stop here. Chris, we'll, obviously, we'll have you back again before the election day uh, many times. Give us uh, an idea. We can find out more about your campaign for House of Delegates. Well, of course, I'm on Facebook, uh, but the uh, my website just went live. It's uh, Anders the number four WV dot com. Um, I will not hide my views on anything from the voters. I will tell them exactly. They'll know exactly where I stand. I will not compromise. I will not back down. And I'll always back uh, liberty and freedom. All right. Chris, have a good day. Thank you. Chris Anders there at 9 o'clock.